Okay, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's the two o'clock block, and we're talking about global connections now uh, with Basil Chowdhury. Um, he is an expert in the Middle East and has written several books about it, uh, not only uh, nonfiction, but fiction. And uh, we're gonna, today we're going to work with him in comparing abandonment, the concept of abandonment by the United States, first in Syria uh, with the Kurds in October of 2019, and now all the trouble in Afghanistan. Welcome to the show, Fazl. Nice to see you. Thank you, Jay. Very nice to be back here. So tell me about your teaching and your writing uh, and where it takes you these days in an ever more complicated arrangement in the Middle East and in Central Asia. Well, uh, uh, yeah, I've been teaching at Bay Atlantic University for some time in Washington, D.C. Um, that's where uh, I teach as a professor, uh, both at the undergraduate and graduate level. Um, my writing, um, I, I started out in nonfiction, primarily focusing on uh, the history of Iran, then moving over to uh, what we saw in the JCPOA deal, uh, which I had hoped would uh, create and shape uh, some of the more positive elements uh, in the Middle East. Um, uh, but soon after, because of the disappointment that, or what it led to, uh, I, I went into fiction hoping that I could possibly create and shape some stories in that space to attract first, mostly my graduate students uh, to get more into the subject and also to satisfy something that I had long put in place and something uh, now I'm beginning to enjoy. Right, we all wanna do that. But you know, nonfiction has a role in all of this. It as you say, it attracts people, it interests them, it gets them to, study the subject uh, you know, uh, on, a doc on a documentary basis too. So let's talk about uh, you know, the concept of abandonment and what happened in Syria in October uh, of 2019 uh, first, and, and, and then we'll make a comparison against the abandonment that uh, President Biden is being criticized for now. What happened in October of 2019? Well, in October of 2019, uh you basically had the Trump administration making the case that they will withdraw about 2,000 troops, 2,000 American troops that were based in Syria at the time, um, as a way to bring back the troops home and saw no positive, uh, no positive choice when it came to Syria. Um, Syria at the time were pretty much, uh, I, I think things have gotten a lot better, but the issues still remain as it, as it was back then. Uh, I think the, the Russian and the Iranian influence was a concern. It continues to be so. Uh, there is concern in how the northern part of Syria is panning out, um, particularly with the kind of uh, diplomatic deals the Russians uh, had orchestrated, and sometimes they see a lapse in the breakdown of it, but they're quick to reshape it and work along the lines to at least maintain the status quo, which is to say that uh, the best and the most expensive part of, or the best and most expensive part of real estate in Syria is now occupied by the American allies, i.e. the Kurds. Um, they have been able to hold on to what we call Rokova, um, and they've been able to do so primarily not because of their alliance with the United States, although that has played a part, uh, but more so with their relationships on the ground. Uh, they've had to make some deals with, with the Iranian militias on the ground, the Russian forces on the ground, as well as to some extent to, uh, to the leadership in Damascus. I was, uh, well, I remember that um, Trump was, bad, was criticized um, sharply criticized in the last days of October after he did that and into November 2019 for abandoning the Kurds and for, and for, making, and for making that decision without really getting consultation from Congress. Um, and, um, you know, ultimately, uh, the Kurds went over to uh, Syria uh, and Russia had an advantage, an opportunistic advantage. Um, uh, it was all uh, for the benefit of uh, uh, the uh, Tur Turkey um, 
Tayyip um, uh, Erdogan, uh, who probably imposed his uh, his arguments on on Trump. You know, Trump likes people who are <clears throat> right wing authoritarians, and he 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 listened uh, to Erdogan <clears throat> and uh, gave Erdogan a a, a present, uh, namely the Kurds. You know. I don't think he necessarily saw that as a present to Erdogan. I, I think much to what, I mean, not much has been sped, said positively about, uh, particularly in the Western space on Erdogan. But I think in, in reality, he had to understand that there were consequences in the southern border. You know, the southern border is basically uh, a, a bastion of entry points. Uh, I think there's roughly about seven entry points from Syria into Turkey, and they've been vastly used by refugees fleeing the fighting, uh, primarily in Idlib province. And the problem over there, especially for Turkey, was that you cannot accommodate large volumes of refugees, especially when they're just pouring in um, and also taxing your state resources, which in itself at a time of pandemic now, we are realizing is, is, is a huge thing, a, a huge burden of some sort. And so I think what the Turkish president was trying to do was really safeguard his borders and really trying to safeguard primarily to make sure that there is a, as at least a no conflict area in the south of its border. Um, I don't think Trump saw it that way. I, I think Trump just saw it in the sense that uh, this would be a way to bring back troops home over a war that was not reaching a conclusion. Yeah, stop to stop the uh, the endless wars, the endless involvement in wars in the Middle East, and that's what he said. And I, I, he felt, I think, that um, that his base would like to hear that. Let's get out of uh, other people's wars. <clears throat> and unfortunately, uh, he did it summarily. He did it quickly. He did it without consultation and without thinking through what would happen. And, and uh, the great tragedy was the abandonment of the Kurds uh, who had fought with the U.S., who had been um, a noble ally with the U.S., who had given us an advantage there. And all of a sudden they were abandoned, left adrift um, without, without friends, so to speak. So they made friends among the Syrians, which were enemies of the United States and probably still are. Uh, and so that, you know, that was troubling. Also, as I recall, uh, Fazl, there was a release of prisoners at the time. Uh, Trump, Trump let that happen. And, and uh, some hundreds or thousands of ISIS prisoners were let go and back on the street, wasn't it? Well, I mean, I can't speak too much about that because unfortunately uh, I didn't cover that part of the story. But what I do remember specifically at that episode is that Look, I mean, for instance, Syria was this open space. It had gone into this, this uh, a result of Arab Spring to basically chaos, and the government in Damascus was just ill-equipped to manage the crisis. Uh, part of that crisis, uh, what I remember most, most well, was that it came from the drought in the countryside, which forced the population to look for employment into the cities and the cities were already uh, overstretched and that gave a huge problem to the, the government of Damascus, which in itself was fighting uh, a, a, in some capacity of sanctions of sorts because they were under, basically in a kind of quasi-proxy war against Israel. They were kind of caught up in the middle between something where they were trying to develop some kind of safeguard between their borders with uh, what they had established with Lebanon. Lebanon was a problem. Um, so there were a lot of problems that the regime had that was ongoing. Um, and the issue of the Arab Spring, Arab Spring and the revolution that followed, and primarily the population just wanted better employment, better form of living. Uh, the cheaper electricity, cheaper gas, some of it could have been mitigated, but Damascus and primarily the Assad regime responded pretty violently to squash this, uh, this protest. And unfortunately, this is what happened when, you know, you have like fragments of the army basically revolting, uh, creating their own kind of 
groups to fight the regime. And, and so for the United States, I think what was mostly important was that when you see images of barrel bombs dropped on population, and these are very disastrous barrel bombs that the regime used in all the outside areas, destroying land, destroying homes, primarily hospitals, I mean, this is a concern. And, and I think the, the intent was right to send forces to do something. But what that scope was, was not well defined. And that is where I think I have questions in terms of like, you know, I mean, if, if, the, if there was no direct defined scope in understanding what uh, American forces were going to do in Syria, then surely pull them out. Well, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a parallel universe here. Uh, you can make that decision on a geopolitical basis, um, but you have to do it in such a way so that you don't leave uh, a mess, but you don't leave it worse than it was. You don't leave chaos. And he was criticized in November of 2019 for doing just that. And then he reversed himself. And I remember the really ex extraordinary photographs of American troops leaving Syria, and on the same road, American troops coming back into Syria. Two-way traffic. Uh, <laughs> that, now, that is chaos. <clears throat> I don't know how yeah. it ended up, but, you know, I he mean, was that, mightily criticized for abandoning the Kurds and hmm. leaving a mess. I, I think that's one of the problems with this, these kind of situations, because if you don't have a very defined role in place, a defined mission in place, and then you take a decision, pretty much not knowing what the environment is. Um, you will come across to these kind of problems where at one day you will say, let's pull out. And the other day you will say, no, wait, it's too costly. It, it, it's too costly geopolitically because there are other players in, in the environment. And those players were very much uh, present. You know, Russia today, you know, they, they've been very present very uh, uh, active in their in the northern part of Syria, Iran-backed militias uh, that are also operating between Iraq uh, are also very much present in the southern part of of, of Syria. Um, and so, when you when you have to study these considerations, I don't think I don't think the president would have made those kind of um, kind of measures because ultimately, you know, you could see on both sides what happened pulled it out, the other players would step in. But if you remained, there remained a question on what was the reason you would keep the troops there for? Well, it's, it's, easy, it's hard to, it's not easy, it's hard to, to uh, thread the needle on the, the sort of thing. You have to stay between those, those two mm, disastrous possibilities. Um, and and what, you know, what, I, what I find interesting is that all the other players in the area that you named uh, they, they don't wish the United States well. Uh, they would like to see the United States embarrassed. Uh, they'd like to bring it down, bring it low, um, and criticize it. I mean, you know, Russia would only love to see the United States embarrassed. The same thing with Iran. Um, and certainly, um, you know, what's happening now uh, leaves other countries too to uh, see the United States embarrassed. Um, and it is being embarrassed. So I'd like, to, I'd like to visit with you on the Afghanistan, on the Afghanistan issue. Um, strikes me that um, just as uh, in the Syrian abandonment, the abandonment started a long time ago. The abandonment was set in motion during the Trump years, uh, maybe around the same time when he was, um, you know, extolling the virtues of getting out. Um, you know, no more endless wars sort of thing. Uh, but, but he didn't have the skill in his his administration didn't have the skill to find that balance about getting out without leaving a mess. Um, and um, so I, I suggest to you that his abandonment policy actually began hmm, probably close to that. And then he made this agreement with the, uh, the Taliban uh, that was a giveaway agreement. The same sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the same sort of vacuous immediacy. Uh, that he applied in, in Syria with the Kurds. Absolutely. And so we had an agreement which was useless for the United States, but it made him look like he was getting out. What, what's your recollection of that? 
Well, I mean, I, I, you know, I had studied on this quite a bit, and I remember quite specifically that there was a huge push to get out during the Obama years. There was a, a round of talks with Karzai's government that, you know, there should be a time when uh, American forces should pull out. Uh, but there was resistance to that, particularly with the leadership in Afghanistan, um, because it, it's fragile. It was, it, I mean, I'd like to argue it was always very fragile, but more particularly, more so fragile, particularly after the election of Ashraf Ghani, uh, because there were particularly a lot of uh, accusations of voter fraud, there were accusations that this was not a legitimate government. And, and what made it even worse, I, I suspect, is that as you went to do the agreement with the Taliban in 2020, with the Doha agreement, a year before that, uh, there had been huge uh, push from American forces to secure areas that were believed to be uh, primarily quasi-Taliban areas. Um, now, the problem here is that, you know, as you are conducting an agreement with the Taliban through the Doha agreement, there's nothing set in stone or in place. And the other issue is that the, the, the Afghan government, based in Kabul, is not in attendance to this agreement. Um, and so whatever deal you strike with the Taliban, um, somehow you will have to figure out a way to basically pull in the government in Kabul. And so all the, while all this is going on, there's a resurgence from the Taliban at uh, at the ground level in this in 2020, um, which basically was the catalyst to lay the groundwork to what we see just a couple of days ago in their smooth sailing into Kabul. Yeah, <clears throat> so um, th this is, it, does, it strikes me that, that we were trying to get out of Afghanistan for a while. We were, you know, setting these dates. I always wonder, by the way, uh, Fazl, uh, about setting dates and then announcing them to the world about exactly what your plan is, especially yeah. in the Middle East, where people would be opportunistic about that, and they will fashion their own plan around your plan. And you, you know, you silly fellow, you told me everything I needed to know. Now I'm going to hoist you uh, based on what you announced. <clears throat> but this yeah, was going I on a long time. Yeah, I mean, there has been a lot of indication to say that, you know, I mean, you know, we why there was a lot of criticism behind the date set for leaving. Uh, why was it pronounced in the way that it was? Um, I, I personally think that President Biden did a fantastic job in, in making a policy to withdraw from Afghanistan. The problem here is that, it, it, you know, I mean, you don't want to get out of a, Afghanistan during fighting. Uh, which is what we are in right now. The fighting stops in Afghanistan during winter. Perhaps it would have been best if the pullout would have happened sometime in the winter. Uh, but, you know, to, to some, some semblance and into some relief, um, you haven't seen that kind of uh, outflow of refugees, uh, particularly in the Pakistan border crossing, or in the Iran border crossings. I mean, you have seen a lot of problems at the airports, the images that we've seen, uh, you know, the, they were horrific. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it's not something you would like to see, particularly at a very difficult time like this. But on another front, um, the border areas have remained quiet. I mean, Kabul is going back to normal, but there is a eerie feeling from, the reports I get from people that I know, I have students in Kabul um, who, whom I know, whom I've taught, and I worry for their safety because of all this. Well, do you take the uh, Taliban seriously when they say they're, they're going to be reasonable, they're not going to round up people who work with the Americans, they're not going to, um, you know, uh, uh, impose uh, uh, stringent requirements on women and and girls, do um, you take them seriously or are they just saying that because they would uh, like to improve their relationships and thus their uh, access to money from the country? 
it's difficult to say it's way too early but but there are some things that that cautions me about them but there are also things that that tells me that you know this time there's hope that something would be different because because from what i understand and and, and this is kind of like in a in a larger context is that the new generation of afghan fighters are much more uh, aggressive and belligerent than the ones that were in the past. Uh, oh, that's very interesting. You mean the Taliban now? Yeah, the, the Taliban now uh, are much, uh, I mean, the new generation anyway. Uh, but at the same time, they've learned a lot. You know, they're part of the social media generation. They, have, uh, they, are, they are experienced in um, high-tech gadgetry. They're, they're experienced in mobile phone networks. They're, they're they're savvy they're technologically savvy if they are that also means that they understand that the consequences of going back to what they did in the past or what the group did in the past will not be taken lightly um and so it is to their benefit if they can find some kind of legitimacy with players on the ground i.e russians i.e iranians i.e even uh from pakistan um, and also, well, the, mention- there's been reports that they have access to money from Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. Uh, they have to raise money. You cannot run the country without money. Uh, their funds that were held in the United States have been locked up. I, I think the same goes for the EU. Um, the result is that to find new sources of money right away in order to run the country because they have control of it. They need, no, I mean, that very well might be true. That, that very well might be true, Jay. But like, you know, think about it. Like, you know, you, you've taken over, uh, you've taken over a country. You need to basically win the hearts and minds of this country first before you actually won. Um, for a long time now, I think the Taliban has conducted itself to have a very, very specific campaign to at least get uh, the countryside or the surrounding areas and the major cities outside of the world to their, to their side. And they've done so by mainly convincing the population to end this war. Um, you, you know what I mean? The, the Afghan population, even before what we've seen, like in the last week or, uh, or, the, or the week before, it, they've been fed up with the wars that has been going on. There's been bombings in the countryside. There have been like, you know, a, 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 like conflicts between uh, the the Afghan army and uh, and Al Qaeda and, and even uh, other uh, groups and I think they just wanted an end to this and the only uh, way but to but they're also clearly it. terrified of the Taliban. Terrified. Well, I mean, I mean all is, the reports are consistent, they, and they're yeah, trying to get no, out of the country. So uh, yeah, go ahead. There is a consensus that not every group is for Taliban, but they, I suspect a lot of the population just wanted an end to the war. And they saw the fact that if they did side with the Taliban, maybe that would give them some semblance of, of no conflict. Um, because certainly there are reports saying that there are populations that simply did not trust the government in Kabul. They did not consider the Kabul, the Kabul government to be effective, particularly with the problems with poverty, problems with employment, problems with getting farmers just basic jurist, basic laws and rights. Um, and, and that is just a basic rule of law, which the Taliban- But the US had plenty of involvement in, in um, trying to make uh, Afghanistan a better place. I mean, the rights of women, for example, um the army for whatever good or no, no good it was um and the, you know the, the u.s was laying money all over afghanistan for 20 years and, and the u.s was a sort of a benign force um you know rule of law consistency all that we you know we we don't like violence particularly we don't like uh, um you know atrocities <clears throat> so i think i think a fair amount of the number of people um, who try to get out and hanging on the bottom of, of uh, military planes, uh, people who are leaving for other places if they can, trying to get out of the country, they're terrified of the withdrawal of that. And, and that takes me to the point of about of, of abandonment. Uh, <clears throat> so 
you know, number one, it seems clear that the people in Afghanistan were a good number of them, and especially the ones who were somehow dependent or working with the Americans, um, feel they've been abandoned. And the world, I mean, the world takes that. The world is generally responding uh, favorably. I mean, resonating with the notion that again here, the United States abandoned the people who were helping it, its agents and friends. And my question to you is, uh, you know, how 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 pervasive is that thought around Afghanistan, and how uh, what kind of implication does it yield um, on a global basis? Well, I mean, I can't speak for every Afghan out there. I, I'm, I'm sure, like you know, there there's several rounds of beliefs and emotions circulating around that question. But one thing I do like to mention is the fact that, you know, I mean, it is the Afghan government that has the responsibility to take care of the citizens, number one. And the United States, the United States can only assist. And after some time, when the recommendation has been that some practices needs to be stopped, i.e. corruption in the government, i.e not getting proper funding to several sectors of the government. Um, one of the reasons why the army fell like the way it did is not because we have not trained them well, what, not because we've not trained them well, but because of the fact that they were not getting proper pay or food or rations for the last few months or so. And that is not the responsibility of the United States. That is the responsibility of the government in Kabul. And so when you take that all in, um, I'm sure many Afghans are as frustrated with their government in Kabul, just as they are frustrated with the fact that now there's no safeguard with the fact that the United States is withdrawing. Now, you can say it's an abandonment, yes, but for, for those of us like myself who are observing this miles ago, I say that the fault lies in really making sure that the government in Kabul was not well equipped, was not equipped enough to understand what was going to happen, despite several warnings from the Obama administration and from the Trump administration to say, you need to get your house in order, which I'm pretty sure they did. What about the people who claim the United States abandoned them? Is, uh, you know, that, is there are hundreds of thousands that feel that way. And Furthermore, a lot of people in this country feel that way, uh, including a lot of um, military people who have served in Afghanistan and dealt, um, you know, face to face. They've been engaged with the Af Af Afghani people, um, and and um, they are very sympathetic to the uh, Afghani terror now. Uh, who you know the the Afghans who worry about what's going to happen under the Taliban. And, um, you know, and then there are people around the world that resonate, you know, that uh, sympathize uh, with that, empathize with that. And, and so, you know, there's a, there's a general reaction about abandonment, such as we abandon the Kurds, the same thing. And so my, my concern is, um, you know, where does this take us and them and the world and America's place in the global order if we keep getting a reputation for abandoning the people We've helped. Who've, I mean, who've helped us? Who've helped us? I mean, yes, there is. I mean, I, I see there's a moral responsibility to to help those who help us. Um, but at the same time, this presence in Afghanistan, um, like I mentioned to you in Syria, did not have a defined goal. Um, if we were there to protect. The government in Kabul, you would be protecting a government in Kabul that was largely out of touch. Well, would with... you, whatever we did, we did it with the help of these people. By definition, they helped us. Um, yes, and, you know, yes, maybe they... maybe it was opportunistic on their part, but that's what they did, and they and they took a certain risk over it. So the question is whether you would bring them back. How much effort and money would you would you put in to bring them back, and how how much um, how how soon? should we have started bringing them back? I mean, this would have had to be a long drawn up plan. I mean, I'm certainly not uh, an architect of policy, but I can certainly say that in the form of planning, um, if, if 
there was a, a, a seriousness to bring those that assisted us over the last 20 years to some form of safety, to some form of way to make sure their families are safe, they are safe, and even provide them the kind of uh, visas um, to help them be secured. I'm sure this should have been a, a, a long, drawn out plan that should not have been at this point where now they're basically stranded. Um, if there was a defined policy on that, you know, that should have been implemented years ago, not now. Um, so it's but, late, it's late, but here we are. <clears throat> and we're, we're almost at a kind of deadline at the end of the month. We, we all know there's not that much time before the, uh, the Red Sea will close over this uh, evacuation. Um, the uh, diplomats will be out of there. There'll be hundreds of thousands of people who would like to be out of there. Um, there's not a lot of time, not a lot of resources, not a lot of options to, to get them out of there. What would you do now? Would you, would you, what would you do? This is not a, you know, from a, a, a humane, a moral point of view, what would you do? And, and last question on top of that, Basil, is what will happen to them if we don't do anything? I mean, you know, this goes back to, uh, you, you know, I mean, like, um, how, how do we, how, how do we, how do we make sure our allies are safe? And the reality is that our allies, just like us, have self-interest. And those self-interests sometimes combine well to an achievable goal, and other times they, they, they remain different and continue to be growing apart. And what has happened in Afghanistan, I suspect, is that as we've had allies, we've also had differences within our allies. And yes, there's, we are at a point now where we are trying to evacuate those that are, are those that have helped us in the last 20 years. We are there now trying to evacuate families of those who try to help us out in the last 20 years. But it's come at a time when we don't know a lot of things of what is going to happen. We obviously need to build some kind of a channel with the Taliban to make sure these things can happen and can happen in a very systematic, orderly manner without any kind of violence. Um, particularly from some, particularly from how they have conducted before 2001. Um, but, but now, um, a, a serious channel needs to develop between the capitals in Paris to London to Washington DC to to uh, from Delhi um, from from Sid, uh, from Canberra uh, all towards a regime now that says that okay we are the true representatives of this state now the problem here is this there is an opposing government right now okay uh, there is an opposing government in Afghanistan that is led by. Amrullah Saleh, uh, uh, the former uh, first vice president, and uh, the son of Ahmed Shah Massoud. Um, and it is, uh, they have control of what we consider seven districts, which is still not covered by the Taliban. So unless a, a viable and a, and a, and a well-formed and well-meaning uh, election takes place in Afghanistan, where there is some kind of a legitimacy, to say that these are the new representatives and these are the new elected representatives. Yeah, that's a really good point. The leadership and, and, has not yet been established. We don't know who to talk to. Um, that's right. another guy, Ab Abdul Barasada, uh, Bar Bar Barada, um, who was just brought back in. He was uh, involved in uh, Afghanistan government a long time ago, and there are those who want to see him as the leader. And so it's not clear. They do need to have an election. And uh, <clears throat> you know the problem is that sometimes elections take a long time to get organized. Sometimes they're not fair. Sometimes they're violent. Sometimes people do not accept the result of the votes. So it's a long way to go before things settle down. So <clears throat> the people who would like to get out um, may or may not be able to get out. As you said, it's, it's, it's too early to know. But yeah. you know, we, we yeah, don't it's... have a lot of time, though. And, 
in the context of what the Taliban will do over the next few days or weeks before August 31. And so well, my last question to you, Fazl, is what do we say to them? What, what do you, you know, speaking for the United States, what do we say to those people, you know, who, who desperately want to leave? What do we say? I mean, I, I'm obviously not a spokesperson for any government and I've never have been. And I, I've known a lot of diplomats of the course of the time that I've been in my profession. Um, I honestly can't speak to that. Um, you know, history has shown us that uh, we, we, allies are allies. And like all allies, as I said, um, there are, there's a timeline to these relationships. Um, and, and what I want to emphasize also is the fact that it, it may not be as bad as we think. You know, I, I'm not saying, I, I'm not guaranteeing that, but I, I'd like to emphasize this because, because the group that is now in Kabul, the, the, the leadership in Kabul right now, they may have links to their past. They may have links to, to awful practices, i.e. not giving rights to women, i.e. not allowing uh, certain kinds of music to be played where there was previously a, 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 a kind of like a nightlife in Kabul where they used to enjoy. But I, I do like to emphasize this, is that in the last two years, you've had a very vibrant Afghan population. Afghanistan is a population of roughly 38 million. It is a young country. I, I think the average age is roughly around 90. And I don't think in this day and age, any kind of new or, or upcoming leader of Afghanistan is willing to risk with the practices an entire or majority of a generation of, of a country has been accustomed to and reverse it and reverse it in the most violent manner to the point where they believe that this is the rightful thing. They may very well do it, but they run it at the cost of overwhelming opposition, whether it's in the ballot box, whether it's by the gun, or whether it's by the surrounding areas that they're, uh, they're uh, I mean, what I mean by surrounding areas, I mean primarily the countries that surround. Afghanistan is a landlocked country. It cannot survive on its own. It has to figure out a way how to have a viable relationship with countries like Iran, Pakistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, um, and most importantly, Russia and China. Um, if they do conduct the kind of practices that they have in the past, I'm very sure there will be a, re a reaction, a reaction they themselves cannot afford to have, particularly in this day and age. All right. Very interesting, Fazel. Thank you for your perspective on these things. Really appreciate you coming around. I hope we can do this again because I know there'll be more to come. I know that to the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Fazel Chowdhury uh, from New York, New York. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Aloha.